Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Whiskey Dictionary. Tonight, I have a special guest, uh, David from Rossville Union. Uh, we're going to be talking all about the both the uh, barrel proof and the regular, and we'll get right into it. So check this out. Every rye has a history. Racks of charred barrels, storied mash bills, time-honored flavors. Sure, every rye has a history, but none like this. This is a rye two centuries in the making. One that transformed Lawrenceburg, Indiana into Whiskey City, USA. Made with the heart of next generation craftsmanship and the soul of 1847. Uncommonly complex, unapologetically spirited. A spice unlike any other. So let's raise a glass. To history to artistry, to mastery. We are Rossville Union. We are the masters of rhyme. All right. Hey, David, how's that for an intro? Oh, very great. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. So thanks very much for joining me. Oh, uh, thanks for having me. To everybody in the chat, this is David Whitmer. Uh, he is the master blender with Rossville Union. And... Um, he is a very interesting guy. We were actually just chatting backstage. We got some some fun stuff to talk about tonight. So, uh, do you, sorry. Okay. No, I'm just um, agreeing with you. <laughs> very, <laughs> I'm agreeing. I'm very interesting. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I just want to say hi to everybody in the chat. Uh, thank you guys for joining me here. If you guys have any rise, by all means, pop them tonight. Um, it's a good night for rye. Mm -hmm. So, David, why don't, yeah. why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So, um, I grew up on a, a little farm, in a farming community, actually, in, uh, in Missouri. My, my parents had a dairy farm, and so uh, I was always around grain and agriculture, and my, uh, my father was uh, a science teacher before he got into school administration. My mom was a nurse, and so kind of always liked all things science and, mm -hmm. and just mixing things and playing around things, and uh, it, it led me to a, a a career in science and then of course with with MGP and and getting to be in this master blender role uh, it's just been a lot of fun and um, you know when you when you go to work every day and you get to try great whiskeys and bourbon and gin uh, how, how can you beat that so it's just it's just a great it's been a, a really really great career and I've I've enjoyed every minute of it nice. and yeah, it sounds uh, a bit like living the dream honestly well you know yeah. it's still a job you know it's still a job. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's a fun job and it's got a lot of fun perks like like talking to all you folks tonight about um a relatively new whiskey Rossville mm -hmm. Uh, from MGP. I know a lot of you know about MGP. Uh, maybe some of your favorite brands are from MGP. And for some people, you're saying, who's MGP? And I generally say, well, we're the largest distiller you've never heard of in that regard. Um, we do make a lot of rye whiskey. We do make a lot of high rye bourbon. And we also make a lot of gin and vodka that doesn't always get talked about on shows like this. But uh, mm -hmm. we are actually the largest uh, North American distiller of gin. And a lot of people don't know that either. So I actually uh, didn't know that either. Well, <laughs> I, I did a video on yeah. MGP and I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So, so we do a, a lot of things in spirits. And for many, many years, we've done them for other people. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, we decided to come out with our own brands. First, we came out with a bourbon, uh, that bourbon behind you, uh, yep. George Remus. Yeah. Right yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is a high rye bourbon, which is mm -hmm. appropriate still in uh, August, the, uh, the month of rye. Mm -hmm. uh, but our rye whiskey brand is Rossville. And uh, here in a little bit, I'll tell you the story of why is it Rossville and how did Lawrenceburg really get its foothold into, into whiskey? We can talk all about that. Perfect. Well, one thing I, I always try to do whenever I have a guest on is mm -hmm. I like to crack the whiskey real, real early, um, mostly because it, it's a good conversation starter. So which one, I mean, I, I would assume we'll start with a non-barrel strength. Um, that's right. Yeah. We'll start okay. with the uh, master crafted that's at 94 proof. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. So then I'm going to pour some out. You, I'm assuming you have more than a few bottles at your, I, at your place. I am ready. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you in your house with uh, with that nice little collection behind you? or are you, I uh, am. I am at my house. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's good. You know, have, uh, speaking to the pretty much everybody in the chat right here has a collection of 
some volume, uh, usually a pretty good. impressive volume. So good yeah, deal. Very, very good. All um, right. Cool. Well, All did right. you, uh, you have a drink? Yes, I do. Well, cheers to you. Thanks for being on the show. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Mm. I love a well-balanced rye. I, I also love ryes that like just kick you right in the teeth, but I, I like a well-balanced <laughs> rye, and that's a well-balanced rye. I, Thanks. Uh, yeah, no we, problem. It's we purposely, when we put this together, we wanted it to be what we're calling an approachable rye. Mm -hmm. So not everyone is into the rye category. Yeah, you know, they're just, a, they like high rye bourbon. Mm -hmm. They still like that sweetness from the bourbon, from the high, higher corn content. They've tried rye, maybe a non-MGP rye, and, and didn't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we certainly wanted ours to be exactly what you said, well-balanced, mm -hmm. uh, smooth, but very approachable if you're new to the rye category. Yeah. I mean, I could absolutely see this. This is good straight, but I could see this in cocktails for sure. And I feel like it would carry a cocktail really well. Absolutely. So when you think about our... The classic cocktails, they were all designed around rye whiskey. Yep. Uh, you know, we were making rye whiskey before we were making bourbon. And so all of those ingredients in the classic cocktails, as well as a lot of the great new ones, uh, rye just complements those ingredients so well. Mm -hmm. And it was purposely bottled at 94 proof so that when you use Rossville Union Mastercrafted in a cro cocktail, mm -hmm. it's not going to just be diluted out where you just yeah. pretty much have punch. And so uh, you want a higher proof. But yeah, if you want to sip it, be on the rocks, it's still a, a great rye whiskey. Yeah, I know a lot of uh, bartenders nowadays are, are going for the higher rye or higher ABV anythings that they're making, whatever, mm -hmm. they make, because they want not only do they want their customers to leave happy, uh, maybe tip a little higher, but also yeah. just, they, <laughs> they want to be able to play with the flavors of the, the whiskey. And if you're watering it down or if you're you're diluting it, it's a better way to put it. You're mm -hmm. a lot of that. So, yeah. One thing I like about this as, as well is is just even though it's got that distinctive rye characteristic, there's mm -hmm. like citrus and specifically orange in this, which yes. I find mm -hmm rare in, in rise personally. Right. Um, and part of that is, is because this is not a single mash bill rye. Mm -hmm. So at MGP, we make rye whiskey all the way from 51% rye all the way up to hundred percent rye. Mm -hmm. Most people know MGP for what's called the 95, five, 95% right. rye, 5% barley malt. Um, and even in the, in the 51 percent you know, what do you do with that other 49? We make some that's 45% corn and 4% barley malt mm -hmm. with that 51 rye. We make some that's 51% rye, 49% barley malt. And because we tend to take a single mash bill and sell it to other people, we decided that we would take our various rye mash bills and mingle them together for Rossville Union. So I can't tell you the mash bill of Rossville because it's a combination. Right. And so because there is some of that uh, 51, 45 corn, it's a little sweeter. And mm -hmm. then there is some of that very high rye, rye whiskey in this for that rye spice. And so when you put them together, and this is always the job of a master blender, that one plus one must equal three, four or five, yeah. that you've, yeah. you've added complexity as well. Mm -hmm. And so you do get that sweetness. You do get some of those. Um, more citrus notes, but then of course you get the rye spice. So you actually kind of kind of segue in, uh, segued into a topic I was gonna like. Sorry, I was really hoping to cover. So we'll just okay. get right into it. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the gory details of actually picking out a hundred. I think in this case, one hundred and fifty nine barrels. Like, how do you do that? How do you? Yeah, do you, you know, that that blows my mind. And I, I get that you're going for a general profile, but like. Exactly. Talk to me about that. Now, before I jump into that, for yeah. people who don't have a bottle with them, mm -hmm. um, when we uh, came up with Rossville Union, uh, there are certain things we wanted to disclose on the label. Mm -hmm. In um, On George Remus, we say it's non-chill filtered. Well, Rossville is also non-chill filtered. Mm -hmm. But you often hear this or you see this term small batch. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean? Right. You know, some whatever your smallest batch is small batch. Or you see batch one, mm -hmm. batch two. Yeah. Okay, you're still at it. Batch three, great. You know, but 
but none of that means anything either. Mm -hmm. And so what does mean something is for your bottling, how many barrels did you use? And so the bottle you have there, as well as the bottle I have with me, uh, there were 159 barrels used for that bottling. Mm -hmm. So that's a standard 53 gallon when it's full, uh, charred American white oak, uh, number four char on the staves and two on the heads. And then of course, every year you lose some to angel share and uh, the rye whiskey in this is five to seven years old. But as you look at those barrels, you're going to go all the way back to when I call when those barrels were born, when the distillate came right off the still and we evaluated it. And there's different characteristics you're going to get out of that. Now, this is all on aroma. And so as we go through our typical daily distillate panel to evaluate uh, our, our whiskey before we put it in a barrel, uh, we'll give it a score and we'll give some general mm -hmm. comments. Mm -hmm. And as a whiskey ages, you survey those various batches. And you'll go pull a few barrels from those that maybe year one and then year two. And you just see how they're aging and you can compare those initial notes. Oh, yeah, I still get some of that. Or that's really dissipated and something else has taken off. Mm -hmm. And then that's also true by where it is in the warehouse, which warehouse, which floor. Um, and so as you start surveying. Actually, let, let me pause you for just one second. Just pause me right away. Perfect. Yeah. Because <laughs> so. When you're making notes, I imagine mm -hmm. they're very different than what I typically give as notes on, on my channel. Um, do you, like, what would be an example of what you would, I mean, you said it was, it's stored in the computer or do you write it on the barrel or what do you do? As far oh, as the, they yeah. all end up in a computer. Okay. Perfect. So, so there's, so there's like, too many barrels and too many notes. Yeah. Do you, and, do you, do we have a team of master blenders, just like mm -hmm. we have a team of master distillers. MGP okay. doesn't believe in the, the one person master yeah. blender or the one person master distiller. And so the team, as, as we survey and as we try different barrels, you know, you get different perspectives and then you get other people's notes that you'll co combine as well. So is there a team of master blenders just for Rossville union as well? Uh, for all of MGP's brands. It's just for so, everything. Okay. It could be for uh, George Remus right. or bourbon or our, um, our eight and sand blended bourbon whiskey, okay. as well as the work we do for other people. Right. So you're, mm -hmm. you're helping out with all of that other stuff as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's even better. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't have to just drink the same thing all day, every day, either you get some variation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so talk to me about the, the kind of notes that you would put about uh, a barrel, like you try it pretty, you know, maybe a year in or something like that. What are you, what are you actually writing down? Yeah. The first, the first notes are always going to be just very simple. I know just first impression, you know, mm -hmm. put it down, you know, we're not writing copy for a magazine. Right. You know, well, that's not, actually part of the reason I asked. Is, yeah. is, <laughs> I'm always doing this with a flair of entertainment or, or descriptive. You know, I would imagine yeah. you're just like, like, you know, vanilla or something. <laughs> so, or, yeah. So you, you're always going to get, well, generally you should always get what I call the classic barrel notes of mm -hmm. vanilla, uh, butterscotch, caramel, all those things come from a barrel. And right. with a, with a rye whiskey, the rye will tend to mute those compared to a, a bourbon mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of corn. Now, if it's a rye whiskey with a lot of corn, those are going to come out stronger than if it's a hundred percent rye. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, at first they're just very, very generic, very simplistic, I should say. Um, um, you know, you kind of rate the rye spice mm -hmm. and for any of the people who watch this, um, you know, if you want to get your head around rye spice, I always say, just think of three different breads. I want you to think of wheat bread, corn bread, and then rye bread, wheat bread, perfect for holding a ham sandwich. Cornbread is sweeter, even without all the butter and honey we tend to lather it up with. It's just sweeter. That's what makes a bourbon sweeter. Mm -hmm. And then you think of a rye, you know it's bold. You know, you think of a Reuben. A Reuben without rye isn't a Reuben anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that bold characteristic is what I'm also talking about when I talk about rye spice. But just with those three breads, uh, you can see a difference in the grain. Then that also carries over into a whiskey. Mm -hmm. And so that boldness of rye, that spiciness of rye, 
um, in some barrels might be more muted than others. And then some it's, it's very pronounced. And then there is this characteristic of MGP rise, especially in the higher rise of having this dill note, D I L L dill yep. note. And so, and not everybody picks that up. I've, yeah, I've, I don't get that very often, but I will, uh, people, people tell me like, Hey, this doesn't taste like pickles to you. I, I don't really eat pickles personally. So that yeah. might be part of the reason why I don't really like pickles all that much. Um, so be. maybe it's just not in my, in my, you know, memory as much. So. Well, I've found that somewhere between just by doing tastings with people and talking to them, that mm -hmm. somewhere between 30% to 50% of the people don't pick it up anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, and, but the people that can pick it up, they always pick it up. And that's almost how they can tell it's an MGP rye, whether they see Indiana on the bottle or not mm -hmm. is by that dill characteristic. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. Yeah. So now one, one thing I've always struggled with uh, describing in, in my videos is mm -hmm. rye in general. Okay. Like I'll, I'll often say, oh, this has like a rye spice to it. And mm -hmm. I wish I could be more detailed with like nuances of rye spice. Um, mm -hmm. What can you help me out with that a little bit? Like, what kind of things do you taste as the specific nuances other than dill, for example? Mm -hmm. Part of that to help people get themselves grounded in that is that bread example, I get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, there's that bolder characteristic where corn tends to have, a, in, in addition to being sweeter, it's almost a little fuller in the mouth. Mm -hmm. And so, part of the rye characteristic in that boldness and that spiciness is also a little bit of a dryness and not, not dryness in a negative sense, but mm -hmm. it's, it's more of the tactile feeling in the mouth of how that it's, it, not that it evaporates quickly um, because I don't want anybody to be confused with a short finish or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that spice, that's not a pepper and not a burn, but that excites. And so it, it almost leaves a tingle to the tongue mm -hmm. is, is one way, you know, that you've got a higher rye or some rye versus a, especially in a bourbon that might be called high rye, but may, tops out at about 15% is mm -hmm. mostly corn and then a lot of barley malt. Yeah. So that, and I, and I will admit that rye is kind of an acquired taste as you taste more rye, yeah. you'll discern that, Oh, I know what that is, mm -hmm. but it's not well, typically what I suggest people try first, unless maybe I I've had people try bullet rye first only because I felt like just regular bullet was fairly approachable for most people. Mm -hmm. Bullet rye is probably pretty approachable for most people, which, you know, is, is a 95% rye. So it's pretty high up there. And then you mm -hmm. tell, you know, you talk to people about it and they, they tend to like it. So, but you're completely right. Most ryes are an acquired taste, similar to right. like a peated scotch, you know, it's exactly. something that you work into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I've actually found people, it's funny that you mentioned that because I have found that the people that are most comfortable migrating to rye mm -hmm. are scotch drinkers mm -hmm. compared to bourbon drinkers yeah. because there is that kind of characteristic in the scotch that they, they find appealing in a rye, mm -hmm. whereas a bourbon drinker might be looking more really for that more sweeter characteristic. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably true. Yeah. But that's certainly why we use some... Uh, a rye mash bill with some corn in it in this Rossville Union to give mm -hmm. it a little of that sweet characteristic. So you do get a little bit of sweetness on the palate as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you were, you were starting to tell me a story. Uh, you, you mentioned that you, you were into science when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. um, so, so tell me about the, the first time that you distilled uh, anything. Uh, I did my first distillation in the seventh grade. Nice. <laughs> and uh, so every year, you know, you have to come up with the science fair mm -hmm. and, you know, kids are making volcanoes or what's the uh, insulation properties of whatever. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the surveys. And I thought maybe I could I could make alcohol <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe I could sneak it in because you could say it's, you know, you can always use it as a alternative fuel. Right. I don't think, yeah. we, I don't think back then we called it alternative fuel. We just called it a fuel, but anyway, right. you can burn it. So, uh, like I said, my, uh, my uncle and my grandparents had a dairy farm. So I had access to grain. 
Mm -hmm. um, I remember my dad took me to a pharmacy so I could get some enzymes and I think mm -hmm. even the yeast that I used and uh, went down in our basement and I mashed all this stuff up. And uh, I actually put all the mash in various mason jars and then put them in the refrigerator we had in the basement. Uh -huh. And then um, when it was time to set up the distillation column, I did it on our kitchen sink because I needed cooling water. And mm -hmm. my mom thought I was going to burn up the kitchen. <laughs> no, right. and so then I took it to the science fair and I had my little vials of alcohol. I had distilled maybe four or five times. And these professors from the local college were the judges and they were asking me questions about fermentation. I had this fermentation going to generate CO2. It was bubbling into water and all this fun stuff. And so mm -hmm. uh, they looked at the bottle and one of them picked it up and he opened it and he smelled it. And he handed it to the other guy and he smelled it and I didn't think much of it. And the second professor took a little sip of it. <laughs> and I was scared to death. I thought I was gonna get in trouble. And uh, the other guy took a sip too. And they, <laughs> and they put the cap back on, they sat down, they said, thank you. They went and judged some other kids' projects and then they came back. And they asked me a couple more questions and they each took a sip again. And I got first place. And there I don't know if I had the best time fair or they had the best, their best time. I mean, basically I made moonshine, but I think right, they were course, just, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, that, that's what kind of got it started. Little Dave's making hooch. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's really cool. Now, what did did you did? Where did you get the like? How did you put the still together? Did you find one that was kind of already together? Did you just bang some metal together? Like, how did you? Oh, no, it was a, it was uh, it was a glass still, like what you would see okay. in, in in chemistry class. Right. Uh, okay. I I know I used. I'm pretty sure I used copper flake or copper chip or something mm -hmm. in it along the line. But uh, yeah, it was. No, I did. I did not go out and make a popcorn set. You know, <laughs> I, that would have been like words thing. Yeah, it wasn't one of those parts would have been a good science fair project. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that might have gotten me in trouble. I don't know. I right. had to make it look scientific. So yeah, people, people <laughs> like that story. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, actually, uh, one of the guys here was talking about uh, you signed a bottle of uh, his. What is it, Volstead? I think he said. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, a while ago, he was talking about it earlier in the, and we have a, a chat for discord uh, that we, we hang out in every week or, you know, all the time. So um, he was talking about that all day and he was like, I can't wait to see this guy. It'll be fun. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know what that is, so we talked about George Remus bourbon. Yep. Every year we have a annual release. That's our Remus repeal reserve. Mm -hmm. And what's fun about that is we put right on the bottle, um, how the mash bill changes. You know, what the yeah? I thought that was cool. The combination of bourbons in that changes every year, whether it's the years, yeah. how much high rye or medium rye is in that, mm -hmm. and then uh, because 2020 was the hundredth year anniversary of the start of prohibition uh, in our Remus bourbon line, we came out with Remus Volstead Reserve, mm. uh, which was a 14 year old bottled and bond uh, bourbon. Um, it was in a fancy bottle with a box that opened like a clamshell and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, right. and with our repeal, uh, our annual release, it's a, it's a limited release, but it's not so limited. You can't find it. And Volstead was sort of that way, but it was very limited. Uh, I'm sure there's no more in stores anymore. Um, but we still, especially with our repeal reserve, we want pe people to be able to get stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go on a secondary market or buy a bunch of something else to get this. Uh, but if you see it, you better get it because they tend not to last. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard when I, when I was showing people about the, the batch four I have up there, mm -hmm. just, thank you. By, by the way, just for, for posterity, they, they sent me all four of these bottles. So, yeah. um, but, but uh, I tried that and actually I had a couple of my friends over last night. We have, we have these two families that were, were COVID, you know, with mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. we're all kind of doing the thing exactly. so they come over they they call my house disneyland um because <laughs> i've you know i got like 150 bottles of whiskey over there so yeah, well it's um, all disneyland so, <laughs> so they, they come over and they're, they're just hanging down here last night i was like i'm only gonna pour a little bit of this because i want to keep the bottle full for the review but like you got to try this stuff right yeah. so mm -hmm. um and then i poured them a little bit of the um the barrel barrel strength as well okay so, um speaking of which i, I don't yeah, know so uh, talk about that too yeah have you um have you been able to finish your, your first your first whiskey at all? I know I've had you talking most of the time. Uh, I still have some, but 
we can move on to the barrel proof. That's fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are you sure? Because I, I I know you probably don't get to try very much of this. So. <laughs> oh, I know it's very limited. So <laughs> no, no, we can move yeah. on. So sure. So similar to what we talked about with the uh, ninety four proof mm-hmm. on the barrel proof, you'll also see a number of barrels, and on. The one I have is 83, probably the same one you here. have too. Yep. Yeah. We mm-hmm. actually did a couple of bottlings with the same number of barrels. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're thinking about changing that up. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost a way to signal a different bottling batch yeah. if the bottle numbers have are changed up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so as I talked about with the Mastercrafted, the barrel proof is also a combination of rye mash bills. Mm-hmm. Now, so a lot of people hear barrel proof, assume one single barrel, which it's not, right. and would also assume a single mash bill, which it's not. Mm-hmm. Now, they are not the same mash. They are not the same combination, just at two different proofs. Okay. Uh, so when you, whenever you blend, you have to have your final proof in mind because a proof, uh, a, a blend at 100 proof will be different at barrel proof and could even be different at 90 or 94 proof. So you have to know your final proof and blend at that proof uh, right. because the amount of alcohol can uh, really mask or change some of the notes that you want to get out that you know might be lost at barrel proof or might even be more um, accentuated at a barrel proof. So you, you have to know your proof. Okay. So, so I, these, go ahead. I know. I was just going to say that that whole thing, I still want to kind of get a little bit more deep in, into this because so that was actually one thing I noticed is obviously you, you guys have written in how many barrels were in the in the you know in the blend, but then the ABV is printed. So I was like, okay, so they're keeping the same ABV no matter what they do with the the amount of uh, barrels. So then you, you mentioned you want to have the the ABV in mind before you start or before you really put everything together, but like how does it, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me other than you know you're trying to go for some specific thing, but I, well, I guess here. Yeah, here's to, yeah. Uh, hmm? what we did on this. And so, yeah, we did not handwrite the ABV. Okay. <laughs> through, yeah. But it, they were all dumped. And then we had that part printed. Okay. So it, it actually meant after it was dumped, it rested for a little longer, mm-hmm. which really isn't a bad thing uh, to let all the barrels after you dump them mingle. Some people you know, we'll dump and cut or dump and bottle right away. And uh, with the barrel proof, uh, because of that, and that's one reason, you know, a little behind the scenes stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the one reason that labels designed the way it is. So okay. you'll see there's a top section and a bottom section and the bottom section is about number of barrels and proof. Yep. And so that you can only, you only have to redo that part every time you bottle. If that, that makes sense. So, so, yeah. so it's a smaller strip that had to get printed quickly <laughs> after they were dumped, and we knew that final proof. You you approximate the proof by pulling from the barrels, but until they're completely dumped and mingled and ready to bottle, you don't know that exact proof. Like what's that on makes the more sense because I, I, I was surprised. That you, I was surprised that you could blend that many barrels together and that you wouldn't have some variation in what you'd want to bottle it. <laughs> so that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, we we okay. knew you know, within 112 and 113, mm-hmm. maybe 111 to 113, what it was going to be right there. Yeah. Uh, and that's close enough when you're blending. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's more than 10 proof when mm-hmm. you're blending is, is when it's significant. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. now who, who did you learn this all from? Like wh- who are some of your influences and like, like how did you get to be into in your current position? Uh, there's, there's two things. One, uh, I've always been curious and just willing to blend and try things. So Mm -hmm. that you kind of have to have that in you that you just aren't scared to just try it. And then, um, uh, my best teacher, uh, our other, one of our other, uh, master blenders, her name is Pam soul Mm -hmm. and has worked at the Lawrenceburg uh, Distillery. Uh, this is her 40th year, and uh, she has a phenomenal nose and palate, and uh, and the way she uh, looks at things and describes things is just, um, well, it's a gift. And so, 
you, you try to pick up the, on that as much as possible mm-hmm. and just, uh, again, not be really inhibited to tr- just to try different combinations mm-hmm. uh, because there's some real safe things. This brand would have been real safe at just 95.5. Mm-hmm. And because for other reasons, we decided not to do that. And what that really opened up, though, is how to have, and as I should try it so we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. As, as we have then a, a barrel proof rye whiskey that is extremely smooth, uh, a very long finish, and then just really brings out what I think is the best in rye. And, and let's do that. We'll talk about that. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. There's always something to your uh, first sip of barrel barrel strength. Mm-hmm. Of the night. You know, mm-hmm. you definitely need that second sip before you get <laughs> Oh, yeah. It just wakes up your mouth. your mouth ready. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um. So real quick while we're doing this, so Patrick Fulmer, and by the way, thank you to everybody who's been sending super chats. I appreciate it. So Patrick Fulmer um, just was asking about distribution. He'd like to find, I'm not sure if he's talking about the the barrel uh, barrel proof that we're talking about or something else. If Patrick, if you want to clarify, that'd be fine. But just for that concept, are these both pretty much available everywhere? Everywhere in the 16 states we're in. Okay. <laughs> so, right. so we are not nationwide yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're working on that. So you know, people, if they know of MGP, they know they're, they're a big distillery. You distill for a lot of other people. But as a brand, we are a startup. Mm-hmm. And it's important, at least we felt it was important. Uh, we kind of had this first concept of being kind of narrow and deep, meaning that we're in a market, we're in a state, and we need to do well in that state. And uh, we were actually kind of in the states closest to our distilleries. We have a distillery in Kansas, one in Indiana kind of Midwestern states. Uh, it was almost a year before we ventured into Illinois because of course that meant Chicago. And mm-hmm. then it was a little longer and then went into Kentucky and then into into Texas. And so as we've, and then Colorado and then Arizona. So we're, we're moving out into the, the markets where there's more population, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're yeah. just doing it, we've just done it a little slow as opposed to just trying to be in all 50 states all at once. Right. And yeah. people not understanding the brand, and then um, you know, then then you might have problems. So you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what state he's in. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's but uh, if he's somewhere in the Midwest, he'll or Texas, Arizona, or Colorado, he'll be able to get it. I kind of like that concept though, because it, it's whereas MGP obviously would have the ability. I'm sure they have the the funding to just blast you across mm-hmm. the whole U.S. Instead, they're almost making the brand prove itself, which which is kind of cool. Because um, yeah. frankly, I mm-hmm. like it enough. I think it's it's certainly got a place. Um, I uh, I think that's interesting though, because it's it's like a trial uh, before they really just go into it. Plus, I, I imagine they have to stock up a bit on on what you guys are picking from if they're if it's going to prove as successful as I think it probably will. Um, Both of those points are correct. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you've been at MG, uh, MGP for 14 years at this point. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's been a while. What did you do prior to that? So uh, for 16 years, I worked for a very diversified uh, chemical company, uh, Upper Midwest, uh, Iowa, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin. It was headquartered in Milwaukee and uh, did a lot of food ingredients, um, a lot uh, some quite a little bit with alcohol actually mm-hmm. as a, not a distiller as much as a, a provider of alcohol and then did different alcohol blends for people. And so um, it was, it, the company I, I started right out of college with and uh, kept kind of progressing in that and, and really liked it. And then um, uh, MGP also has a food division uh, mm-hmm. with uh, wheat starches and proteins. And uh, they were, w- they're looking for a, a quality manager that had alcohol and uh, food ingredient experience. And I had both and it was actually really closer to home from where I grew up to, to where I had that seventh grade science fair project. And yeah. so that was appealing to me. And so uh, I uh, 
did with MGP and I've been loving it ever since. Nice. That's really cool. So speaking speaking of MGP, this is a this is a question I, I was kind of wanting to ask you. So MGP, as far as MGP brands, official brands, similar to to the Rossville, mm -hmm. I think there's like five or six of uh, like actual whiskey brands, correct? That are all doing similar to what you're doing, I believe. Right. Um, so, yeah. So MGP brands, not not, has, not like people no. buying from MGP. I'm saying right. MGP yeah. official MGP's brands. Yeah. brands. Correct. Right. So so uh, they're I'll just list them. Yeah, so there's right. Till American Wheat Vodka, yeah. which we make at our Atchison, Kansas distillery. Mm -hmm. And then there is Eight and Sand Blended Bourbon Whiskey. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's majority bourbon. That's why you can call it a blended bourbon. Mm -hmm. So it's actually majority George Remus, George Remus with mm -hmm. some Rossville in it, as well as light whiskey and corn whiskey. Uh, which we make in in Lawrenceburg, so it's really a combination of a lot of the different whiskeys that we make. Mm -hmm. Then there's the George Remus Bourbon, and then the annual release of uh, the Remus Repeal Reserve, the Rossville Union, uh, both master crafted at 94, and then barrel proof. And then in April, we bought a small distillery in Washington D.C. It was the first. Uh, distillery built after prohibition and it is the uh, green hat gin distillery and we bought that uh in in march and uh we went out there and we spent about a week and then we came back home and then we couldn't travel anymore <laughs> right <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, and so uh, yeah. we've been uh, kind of running that distillery from afar mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would imagine that to some extent this whole thing has impacted you guys as well. Um, I mean, if if nothing else, wearing a mask doesn't isn't very conducive to nosing whiskey. Um, <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, at, our, at our Atchison, Kansas distillery, in addition in addition to making a lot of vodka for other people, as well as our Till American Wheat vodka and a lot of gin, uh, we do make some industrial alcohol. Uh, we have supplied the hand sanitizer makers and the uh, aerosol disinfectant manufacturers for years. And so we have just been doing a lot of that okay. this year as well. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Uh, all right. So Jeff, Jeffrey Wack wants to know, as far as weeded bourbons go, um, mm -hmm. it, do you suspect MGP is going to put out an official weeded bourbon brand? I don't know as a brand. We okay. do. We do do. Um, wheat whiskey and mm -hmm. some weeded bourbon for other people. Mm -hmm. um, in our in our mind, that those are fairly established. Meaning, um, we really like rye, mm -hmm. <laughs> so whether it's a high rye bourbon or or mm -hmm. rye whiskey, and that's why we call ourselves the masters of rye. So, uh, could there be a place for a, a weeded bourbon or a wheat whiskey in in the MGP brand portfolio? I suppose. Hmm. Um, so I guess never say never. Right. Um, so nothing, nothing planned. Not right yeah. no, I'm mm -hmm. personally partial to, to weeded whiskeys myself. I just, uh, mm -hmm. something about them. I I've just come to like, I think they're, they're very easy to drink, you know, and they're, they're just mm -hmm. kind of nice. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. It's not no, almost maybe like not overly complex, you know, like I, I it, it doesn't matter anyway. So well, well, yeah. think back to that, to that bread example I gave you. Right. Yeah. So you got wheat bread, corn bread and rye bread. So, mm -hmm. Wheat bread's pretty neutral, mm -hmm. and so um, it. I think it does the same thing in a in a whiskey or uh, in a bourbon. It it mm -hmm. it does make it fairly neutral. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's kind of it. It's almost when I'm drinking whiskey, it's usually for evaluation, or you know, sometimes like last night, just to hang out. But usually, it's for like evaluation, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes if I'm if I'm just hanging around, I'll pop a weeded whiskey, uh, weeded bourbon, or or weeded just a weeder, um, and just kind of. Mm -hmm chill <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you can say an mgp likes rye well yeah they re they're really freaking good at it <laughs> so. <laughs> so uh one other thing i wanted to say about barrel proof is um mm -hmm. especially with with bourbons uh you'll have barrel proof uh bourbons that can be you know in the upper 120s yeah. maybe even 130 proof that's usually my uh, my wheelhouse. Is, yeah, is very so, high ABV whiskey. So. Yeah, so at MGP we barrel everything at 120 proof. Okay. Uh, 
maximum by law is 125. Mm -hmm. And you could go a lot lower than 120. Some people do 110. Some people do 100. Not very many people do 100. But um, uh, but at most warehouses, and if you think about the the traditional tin rick house where you walk in on the ground floor, <clears throat> excuse me, and you look all the way up to the top barrel, uh, those rack houses get pretty hot mm -hmm. where in the summer, where as an MGP warehouse, the majority of them are brick mm -hmm. and uh, they're multi-floor, uh, usually six stories or six floors high, six barrel high per floor. And they're fairly insulated by all that brick, thick concrete floors. All these were built uh, in the 30s and early 40s. And uh, in those warehouses, they stay cool and humid, almost like a scotch warehouse. Mm -hmm. And so over time, the barrel is actually absorbing more water than it's losing. And so the proof goes down. Mm -hmm. That's why after five to seven years, uh, the barrel proof Rossville that we're drinking uh, is 112. Started off at 120. Uh, whereas when a warehouse gets really hot, it will lose more water than gain and the proof goes up. Right. Now, I tend to think that when a barrel gets really hot and all that water gets driven off, uh, the whiskey or the bourbon really didn't have a great opportunity to mellow as it ages. Mm -hmm. So it tends to be a little harsh. Now, some people will say, well, yeah, it's harsh. It's 132 proof. Right. But if you want to test that, dilute it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe dilute it down more than just, you know, the little drop of water. People talk about opening right. stuff up. I mean, cut it quite a bit. Yeah. And you might kind of understand what I'm saying, that there is still a little bit of maybe not as harsh, but it's maybe not as mellow as barrels that absorb water over time as opposed to lose. And so... The, the MGP warehouses will absorb water. And I think over time that tends to make for more uh, mellow whiskey that as you then barrel it barrel proof uh, can still be very smooth uh, as you drink it. Mm -hmm. So question about this is actually, you might not be able to answer this. So something I've always wondered is more like how much, how much water really reduces ABV by in say like a glass, right? So everybody's always like, oh yeah, put like two or three drops in there and, and it'll open it up or whatever. And mm -hmm. you know, to some extent, then you're just more dealing with the chemical, the chemical process of, you know, the, the fats and whatever. But um, as far as actually reducing the ABV, I have no clue how much, I don't have a way to test the ABV in my glass. You know, I don't have like all mm -hmm. the instruments. So like how much would you, let's say you had 120 uh, um, proof something or other, and you wanted to put it down to a hundred just to make the numbers easy. Okay. Like how much water are you really putting in? Well, I was going to say, if you want to make it real easy yeah, and it's 120, mm -hmm. if you want to cut that in half, you right. just add half the volume of water. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, I guess that makes a lot of sense. So, so that's <laughs> tough. Fair, fairly easy math that for some reason I didn't put together. As we drink more, let's keep the math simple, okay? Right, yeah. <laughs> That's <a> fair point. <laughs> I'm an engineer, too. I, uh, my teachers are, are, are rolling. Uh, roll, uh, yeah, cursing yeah. me right now. Um, so, so 100 yeah. proof, 50% water, so you're yeah. down to 50. So, yeah. so the, the little, the drop of water, you know, that people talk about to, mm -hmm. to open it up. So a lot of that has to do with, Okay, as, as a glass sets and the alcohol vapors are coming off of that glass, um, if you want to slow some of that down, let's put some water on it. Mm -hmm. And so before that water then completely sinks, uh, it's going to almost create a, a small layer where we're not going to just get all that alcohol in our nostril, but maybe some other aromas. And so it kind of helps cut through that a little bit, mm -hmm. I think. So that's, that's one way to, to think about it. Maybe on a different podcast, we could completely engineer and geek that thing out on, on exactly what it's doing. Yeah, that <laughs> but, sounds good. <laughs> that's kind of the, the general idea about that. Well, um, some people, I think it's psychological that, mm -hmm. you know, they think it's, it's, kind of a high proof and I'll soften it just a little bit with some water. Um, I think that's as much it is. There's some of that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
especially yeah. people that drink a lot of scotch. I, I find that scotch does actually, I mean, maybe, like you said, maybe it's psychological. I find scotch tends to react a little bit better with a few drops of water than say a bourbon does. I mean, I, I've seen plenty of times you just throw like an ice cube in, in a bourbon and still like almost tastes the same. It's just slightly chilled. I don't do that all that often myself, but it's bourbon seems to hold up better to water, uh, at least in my experience than, than most other types of whiskeys. Mm -hmm. so, but I mean, I know we're talking rye too, so I don't yeah. know. I haven't really experimented too much with, with water, rye and, and ice actually. Now I'm thinking about mm -hmm. it. So anyway, and, and I'm not the best person to ask because I drink yeah. most of it need anyway. So yeah, I know I'm kind of this. A lot of people ask me that too. They're, they're like, how much water should I add? How much ice? I'm like, I'm, that's not my specialty. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like seasoning, you know, you do it to taste. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody has a slightly different taste, but I, I do prefer that people, you know, give something a try mm -hmm. in just its pure form. hundred percent. You know, even if, even if you know you're going to put it on the rocks, mm -hmm. um, just try a sip as is so you can appreciate it as is. And then you can decide, yeah, I, I, I want a big, I want yeah. a big cube of ice in that, or I want, or, or I, I need to cut it a little bit. Right. That's fine. It's, somebody yeah. very talented put that in the bottle the way it is exactly <laughs> for a reason, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it makes a lot exactly. of sense. Yeah. So um, let, let's get back to the whole master blender thing. Cause I, I find master okay. blenders actually like completely interesting in, in almost a different way than a master distiller. Like, there's just a, a very different skill set, at least in my mind, um, mm -hmm. where, in a, in a master blender, like let's, let's go kind of generic question. What does a day in your life look like at work? What do you, what is the first thing that you do? What do you do when you notice your nose it, is getting a little fried from, it, from nosing or like it, talk to me all about that. Yeah, you know, it depends on the day. So yeah. um, let's say there's a, a particular project. Let's say even when we went back to initiating, you know, we're going to have our Rossville rye mm -hmm. or we're working on something for another another client let's just say you, you have to know well what are you working with what's your available inventory and so that's kind of your your first your first thing is just like an artist with his colors is like what colors do i have available to me it's which barrels are we working with mm -hmm. and then what ages of those barrels are we working with and so you know if somebody comes to us and wants to develop a whiskey it you know how much do you want to spend and how old do you want this brand to be? So that's the first thing you do is you identify what you're working with. Okay. And then um, you, you can go back to those initial notes, like I talked about. And then as you have surveyed them throughout their life, uh, start looking at, at different barrels. And so when you kind of get an idea of how many batches you want to work with, uh, you kind of start very simply with some simple 50, 50 blends. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a, a seminar called masters of rye. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we can actually sit down with a group of people, yeah. I will give you a, uh, a glass that has uh 51% rye in it. That's uh, 45 corn and 4% barley malt at mm -hmm. 94 proof. And then I'll give you our 95 rye, 5% barley malt at 94 proof. And I'll have you try each one of those. So you can really see the difference between those two rye whiskeys. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have an empty glass by those and a little plastic pipette. Mm -hmm. And I'll pour you a little more. And I say, now I want you to put those together. Okay. And people will do one of two things. They'll else put them together 50-50. Mm -hmm. or they'll be influenced by the one they like the best. They, let's say they like the 95.5 more than the 51, or they like the 50. So, and generally when they do that, they'll do two thirds a third. So they'll be influenced by what they liked the most. Mm -hmm. And then they'll put that together. And so I try, and I said, now try what you made compared to the components. And they'll generally say, well, I like mine better. And I said, okay, I want you to do the opposite of what you did. I mean, if it was two thirds, a third, or if it was 50, 50, I want you to increase one of them mm -hmm. and then tell me what you think. And so we play around with that for a little bit. And then we'll end up trying the Rossville union master crafted, which of, which is cheating a little bit because it's more than just two mash bills and, and two barrels put together. But uh, they, they understand then the, the, 
the power of blending, and then how you might go about it. So you are influenced by what you like, and it's it's a slower process to maybe start 50-50 and then migrate one, of the, one way or the other. Uh, but then when you do that with multiple batches, then you start putting those 50 fifties together. So really, you know, you got 25%, but then of each, if there's four, uh, but then you start kind of pushing one the other way. And as I mentioned, there's a team of us, so it's a collaborative approach. And so somebody else might've come up with a completely different combination. And then, and then we try them and really come up with the best option. So yeah. uh, it is a lot of trial and error in that way. And, you know, there are worse things than whiskey to do trial and error with. And, <laughs> so, right. yeah. and so in that way, it's fun. But um, it, it's also, like you said, you have to stop. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, go check your email for a while and, right. and do some do some other things and then and then come back to it. And then generally what we'll do is we'll round it down to uh, uh, two to maybe three options. And then we'll bring other people in uh, just to try them as they are and kind of, you know, good, better, best, or one, two, three ranking, uh, something like that. Sometimes that might lead going back to the drawing board, but usually it's just a good, better, best. And we're going to pick one. Nice. That actually sounds really cool. I, my, my brain was kind of going of how I could do something like that with the audience here. And, uh, I, I've got a couple of ideas. So thank you for the, hopefully I, I follow through with that. That's a really cool idea. Yeah. And, uh, and, and actually you could do it with, uh, with with known brands, you yeah. know, if the brands tell you the mash bill, uh, it's best if you can, you know, try to keep them really close to the same proof. You know, if one is 90 and one's 94, you're probably OK doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you wouldn't want to do it with barrel proof and right. 90 proof. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So back, back to something we brought up like right at the beginning, just about some of those words that mean nothing. Uh, we keep okay. talking about barrel proof. <laughs> I saw one time I, I forget which brand it was. They, they said batch proof. And I just laughed. I'm like, that means less than nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. it's whatever we decided to make the batch out of. It's that <laughs> so, exactly. You yeah. know, and I think I want to say it was like in the low one tens. You know, like one eleven or something like that. Whatever. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, it's fun when I have audience participation to ask. You know, tell me what small batch means. Right. And there are some people that, you know, because they were at some distillery and they told them what small batch means, they think they know the definition, and it's like. That's a definition, right? <laughs> but there is no definition. It's a marketing term. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean any, it means whatever you want it to be. I, I mean, think I'm I, sure MGP smallest batch is bigger than a lot of places. Biggest batch. That's probably. <laughs> so, yeah. I remember reading. I think it. I think it's Knob Creek has has small batch on it, or I believe it was Knob Creek. And I remember just thinking, I'm like, that's not a small anything. <laughs> <Knob> <laughs> Creek. <laughs> so, uh, um, cool. So I know that you. Um, we're kind of running out of time here. Um, so let's see. Uh, there was something I wanted to ask you. There was um, favorite. Uh, while you're thinking about it, there's something I still want to say. So okay, that's even better. <laughs> well, um, through this whole process, we've been talking about Rossville Union. Mm -hmm. Why the heck did we call it yep. Rossville? That's so the line I have on my list of questions. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay, good. So, so Lawrenceburg, Indiana sits in the Southeast corner of Indiana in the tri-state of Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and it Lawrenceburg's right on the Ohio river. Actually, if I'm standing on top of one of the rack houses, I can see both Ohio and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And starting in about 1804, uh, a little distillery popped up in Lawrenceburg. And within a few decades, there were uh, several dozen distilleries in Lawrenceburg, so many that it became known as Whiskey City. Now, of course, it was on the Ohio, so it was a great trade route to bring goods in and then send things back on down the river all the way to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's in uh, the grain belt, so there was ample grain grown for distilling. But particularly for Lawrenceburg, it sets on this vast aquifer. So when the glaciers came through millions of years ago, dug out this big cavern that fills up with water, that water passes through sand and gravel and limestone, removes the iron and the, and the sulfur that will foul whiskey. But most important for distilling is the water pumped up out of this aquifer is a constant 56 degrees year round. Mm -hmm. 
And so if you're a distiller in the 1800s, you're generating a lot of heat, especially during fermentation that you need to control, which is generally why they only made whiskey kind of in the spring and the fall. Uh, but with this constant 56 degree water, uh, you could cool all the time. And so that was a godsend in the 1800s pre-refrigeration. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of distilleries sprung up. George Ross started the Rossville Distillery in 1847. And it was the Rossville Distillery all the way through Prohibition. And he actually started buying up some of these other smaller distilleries that were right next door to him. Uh, most of the time, the distilleries were only separated by a kettle feedlot because when you make uh, whiskey, uh, you generate, of course, alcohol, but you also have the spent mash, right. uh, the distiller's grain, uh, the protein part of the corn that uh, is great animal feed. So as you look at these old maps of the area, it would be distillery, cattle lot, distillery, cattle lot. And so he started buying up these smaller distilleries and changed his name from the Rossville Distillery to the Rossville Union Distillery to yeah. show all, you know, you're all part of the family now. Mm -hmm. And so um, there, there was the Rossville distillery. Uh, there was the old Quaker distillery, which became Shinley. Mm -hmm. Those ended up being the two main distilleries through prohibition. And then post prohibition, uh, George Ross's heirs sold the uh, Rossville distillery to Seagram's. Okay. And then it was the Seagram's distillery all the way up uh, into the late nineties, early two thousands, many of those brick, just about all those brick warehouses that I told you about were built in that Seagram's era. Mm -hmm. But because that kind of original distillery on our distillery campus was started by uh, George Ross and was the Rossville distillery, we just thought it was perfect to name our rye whiskey after him and that distillery. And that's where we got the name Rossville. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I had I had kind of the Cliff Notes version of that, but that was way more information than what I had earlier. Okay, <laughs> so that's, that's perfect. That's really good, actually. And yeah. I, I love that kind of stuff. I love. I actually really like that he called it the Rossville Union. I think that's that's really neat. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. So, all right. So you uh, you guys are doing the thirty one days of rye, which yeah. uh, I, mm -hmm. I think if, you, if anybody here is interested, you could go check out the um, their Instagram or their Facebook page. Um, yeah. Rossville Union. Mm -hmm. Rossville Union, and uh, you can learn all about that. Um, do you, can you give me like a quick little, like what are the 31 days? It's obviously the month of, month so, of August. so the month of August is uh, rye whiskey month. Uh, we are doing uh, various podcasts like this. Um, I've, well, it's already that the tent and I've already done a couple. <laughs> and so we're going to do a, a few more. And I, I know if you uh, go to about any of the sites for sure, Facebook, uh, there's actually a way to, uh, sign up and win for a very small group, a, uh, a virtual tasting mm -hmm. where um, you'll get the bottles and you'll talk to me and we'll kind of go through the whole lineup. And so uh, I encourage you to, to try for that. Uh, that would be fun. Uh, as much interaction as we can uh, right now when we can't all get together, but uh, that, yeah. that would be a lot of fun to, to do. Uh, we might even be able to work out that uh, Masters of Rye blending I was talking about. So we'll we'll figure something out for that one. So yeah, for sure. So sign and, up uh, for that free tasting. Mm -hmm. As somebody who's tried the whiskeys and talked to you, I can highly recommend the the <laughs> event. Mm, thank <laughs> so, you. No problem. Thanks a lot. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, this is really oh, fun. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. Whiskey is fantastic. I wish you guys all the luck uh, expanding past the sixteen states. Oh and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, if I understand properly, uh, I think you and I and, and potentially some others are going to be doing something again in September for, for bourbon. Um, oh, yes. So. Yeah. September. See, how does that work? You know, we go from rye to bourbon just in those two months. That's that's great. So why not? So it's worth celebrating either way. <laughs> yeah. And if I could make one more shameless plug. Absolutely. Uh, so Good. we talked about I've talked about how uh Rossville Union is a combination of, of mash bills. Mm -hmm. And George, our George Remus bourbon is the same way. It's a combination of combination of high rye mash bills. Whenever you come up with a brand, the, the first day of your brand, it seems like the first thing people want to ask about is when can I do a barrel pick? Yeah. <laughs> and that was a little hard for us to get our head around because 
it's a combination of mash bills. You can't just go pick the mash bill barrel. Right, and so in the first couple of years of this, it was really hard for us to get our head around it. What, how exactly did we want to do it? And, but this year we decided uh, there was enough people asking that we would do it. And so we deconstructed uh, the, the brand, if you will, and uh, offered both in George Remus and in Rossville, uh, various groups, stores, clubs, uh, barrel picks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the barrel picks in the Rossville Union, uh, they, they didn't know it, but it was 51% uh, rye with 45 corn or 51% rye with 49% barley malt. And uh, we would bottle those at 100 proof. Mm -hmm. And then in our George Remus line, uh, they'll be at, they're at barrel proof. Uh, probably next year, we'll do them all barrel proof. So if you're, if you're in your favorite uh, store and uh, they participated in that pick, you will see some uh, barrel picks of Rossville at 100 proof. Uh, barrel picks of George Remus at uh, a barrel proof. And so uh, those would be fun to try as well. In addition to, uh, especially in the Rossville, the 94 proof and, and the barrel proof that we've been talking about tonight. Nice. Yeah. I know uh, a lot of, a lot of people who watch the show are huge fans of store picks and collect mm -hmm. them like they're going out of style because they kind of yeah. are. <laughs> you know, or not not style, but they're they're limited. You know, at well, the, yeah. Like, um, most stores pick one. Um, yep. We we did have most stores picked uh, a barrel of George Remus and a barrel of Rossville, mm -hmm. and depending on you know the size of the store, multiple stores in the city, they did uh, three or four barrels. So, but yeah, those you're right. Um, you only get a limited number of cases off that barrel and then they're gone. So yeah, it's a fun mm -hmm. way to get a different variant on something that you already like. So and exactly. I, yes. Part mm -hmm. of it, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, well, again, I wish you all the luck uh, well, thank for, anybody, you. for anybody who happens to be watching, uh, go check out the whiskey crusaders. They're on now. Um, but thanks again for coming on. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again, possibly in September. Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. Cheers. Right. Have a great rest yeah. of the night. Bye. You too. Bye.